today we will discuss the first part which covers nature of thinking the building blocks of thought and various processes of thinking like problem solving reasoning and decision making let's start with the first concept that is nature of thinking think for a moment how many times and in what ways you are using the word think in your day to day conversations sometimes probably you use it as a synonym to remember i can't think of her name pay attention think about it or convey uncertainty i think today my friend will visit me think has a wide range of meanings which cover a number of psychological processes however in psychological terms thinking is the base of all cognitive activities or processes and is unique to human beings it involves manipulation and analysis of information received from the environment for example while seeing a painting you are not simply focusing on the color of the painting or the lines and the strokes rather you are going beyond the given text in interpreting its meaning and you are trying to relate the information to your existing knowledge understanding of the painting involves creation of new meaning that is added to your knowledge thinking therefore is a higher mental process through which we manipulate and analyze the acquired or existing information such manipulation and analysis occur by means of abstracting reasoning imagining problem solving judging and decision making one of the key characteristics include that thinking is mostly organized and goal directed all day to day activities ranging from cooking to solving a maths problem have a goal one desires to reach the goal by planning recalling the steps that one has already followed in the past if the task is familiar or inferring strategies if the task is new in short thinking is an internal mental process which can be inferred from overt behavior if you see a chess player engrossed in thinking for several minutes before making a move you cannot observe what he is thinking you can simply infer what he was thinking or what strategies he was trying to evaluate from his next move the next concept is building blocks of thought we already know that thinking relies on knowledge we already possess such knowledge is represented either in the form of mental images or words people usually think by means of mental images or words for example suppose you are traveling by road to reach a place which you had visited long back you would try to use the visual representation of the street and other places on the other hand when you want to buy a story book your choice would depend upon your knowledge about different authors themes etc here your thinking is based on words or concepts we shall first discuss what is mental image and then move on to concepts as the base of human thought let's start with mental image Suppose I ask you to imagine a cat sitting on a tree with its tail slightly raised and curved. You would most likely try to form a visual image of the whole situation or think of another example where you are asked to imagine yourself standing in front of Taj Mahal and describe what you see. While doing this you are actually forming a visual image of the event. You are probably trying to see through your mind's eye. just like the way you would see a picture try to remember your earlier experience in reading a map remembering the different places and subsequently locating them in a physical map in your examination in doing this you are mostly forming and using mental images therefore an image is a mental representation of a sensory experience it can be used to think about things places and events the next building block of thought is concepts 
whenever we come across an object or event familiar or unfamiliar we try to identify the object or event by extracting its characteristics matching it with the already existing category of objects and events for example when we see an apple we categorize it as a fruit when we see a table we categorize it as a furniture when we see a dog we categorize it as an animal and so on when we see a new object we try to look for its characteristics match them with the characteristics of an existing category and if matching is perfect we give it the name of the category for example while walking on the road you come across an unfamiliar quadruped of a very small size with a face like a dog wagging its tail and barking at strangers you would no doubt identify it as a dog and probably think it is of a new breed which you have never seen before you would also conclude that it would bite strangers a concept thus is a mental representation of a category it refers to a class of objects ideas or events that share common properties but why do we need to form concepts concept formation helps us in organizing our knowledge so that whenever we need to assess our knowledge we can do it with less time and effort it is something similar to what we do to organize our things at home children who are very systematic and organized put their things such as books notebooks pen pencil and other accessories in specific places in their cupboard so that in the morning they don't have to struggle to find a particular book or the geometry box thus for making our thought process quick and efficient we form concepts and categorize objects and events concepts usually fall into hierarchies or levels of understanding the levels are classified as superordinate which is the highest level basic which is an intermediate level and subordinate which is the lowest level while speaking we mostly use basic level concepts When a person says i saw a dog a basic level is used such a statement is much more likely to be made than i saw a four legged animal that barks and wags its tail or an animal the first is subordinate which is far too specific than is needed for the conversation while the second which is the superordinate is far too vague to convey the intended message children also learn the basic level concepts first and then the other levels most of the concepts people use in thinking are neither clear nor unambiguous they are fuzzy they overlap one another and are often poorly defined for example under which category would you put a small stool would you put it under the category of chair or under the category of table The answer to these questions is that we construct a model or a prototype. A prototype is the best representative member of the category. In prototype matching, people decide whether an item is a member of a category by comparing it with the most typical item of the category. Therefore, in the above example of the stool, you would try to compare it with the standard study chair. if you consider it as a typical example of a chair and a small study table if you consider it as a typical example of a table and you then match the properties of this tool with these two concepts if it matches with a chair you would put it under the category of chair otherwise under the category of the table the next concept is the processes of thinking So far we have discussed about what do we mean by thinking and what is the nature of thinking. We also learned that thinking uses mental images and concepts as the base. Now we will discuss how thinking proceeds in a particular area which is problem solving. Let's start with an example. How do we proceed while repairing a broken cycle, 
a broken computer or a laptop or planning a trip with your friends or patching up with a broken friendship. In some cases, the solution is reached quickly as in repair of a bicycle based on immediately available cues, whereas others are more complex and require time and effort. So problem solving is thinking that is goal directed. Almost all our day to day activities are directed towards a goal. Here it is important to know that problems are not always in the form of obstacles or hurdles that one faces. It could be any simple activity that you perform to reach a defined goal. For example, preparing a quick snack for your friend who has just arrived at your place. In problem solving, there is an initial state that is the problem and there is an end state which is the goal. These two anchors are connected by the means of several steps of mental operations. But what are these mental operations? So now we will discuss the mental operations involved in solving a problem. Let us look at the problem of organizing a play in a school on the occasion of teacher's day. Problem solving would involve the following sequence. The first step is identifying the problem. A week is left for teacher's day and you are given the task of organizing a play. The second step, represent the problem. Organizing a play would involve identification of an appropriate theme, screening of actors, actresses and arranging money. The third step is planning the solutions that is setting the sub goals. Search and survey various available themes for a play and consult teachers and friends who have the expertise. The play to be decided based on such considerations such as cost, duration, suitability for the occasion. The step 4 is evaluating all solutions. You need to collect all the information related to stage rehearsals. The step 5 is selecting one solution and executing it. Compare and verify the various options to get the best solution for the play. Step 6 is evaluating the outcome. If the play or the solution is appreciated, think about the steps you have followed for future reference for yourself as well as your friends. Seventh step is rethink and redefine the problems and the solutions. After this special occasion, you can still think about ways to plan a better play in future. So we have covered what is problem solving and what are the mental operations involved in problem solving. But there are obstacles to solving problems as well. And two major obstacles to solving a problem are mental set and lack of motivation. A mental set is a tendency of a person to solve problems by following already tried mental operations or steps. Prior success with a particular strategy would sometimes help in solving a new problem. However, this tendency also creates a mental rigidity that obstructs the problem solver to think of any new rules or strategies. Thus, while in some situations, Mental set can enhance the quality and speed of problem solving. In other situations, it hinders problem solving. You might have experienced this while solving mathematical problems. After completing a couple of questions, you form an idea of the steps that are required to solve these questions. And subsequently, you go on following the same steps until a point where you fail. At this point, you may experience difficulty in avoiding the already used steps. Those steps would interfere in your thoughts for new strategies. However, in day-to-day -day activities, we often rely on past experiences with similar or related problems. For example, if the last time your computer froze, you restarted it and it worked. That might be the only solution you can think of the next time it freezes. Like mental set, functional fixedness in problem solving occurs when people fail to solve a problem 
because they are fixed on a thing's usual function. If you have ever used a hardbound book to hammer a nail, then you have overcome functional fixedness. The second obstacle is lack of motivation. People might be great at solving problems, but all their skills and talents are of no use if they are not motivated. Sometimes people give up easily when they encounter a problem or failure in implementing the first step. Therefore, there is a need to persist in their effort to find a solution. The next process is reasoning. Reasoning is the process of gathering and analyzing information to arrive at conclusions. In this sense, reasoning is also a form of problem solving. The goal is to determine what conclusions can be drawn from the given information. If you find a person desperately running on the railway platform, you could infer a number of things, such as he is running to catch the train which is about to leave. He wants to see off his friend sitting in the train which is about to leave. Or he has left his bag in the train and wants to get in before the train leaves the station. To figure out why this person is running, you could use different kinds of reasoning, that is, deductive or inductive reasoning. Since your previous experience indicates that people run on the platform to catch a train, you would conclude that this person is getting late and is running to catch the train. The kind of reasoning that begins with an assumption is called deductive reasoning. Thus, deductive reasoning begins with making a general assumption that you know or believe to be true and then drawing specific conclusion based on this assumption. In other words, it is reasoning from general to particular. Your general assumption is that people run on the railway platform only when they are getting late for the train. The man is running on the platform. Therefore, he is getting late for the train. One mistake that you are making, and generally people do commit such mistakes in deductive reasoning is that they assume but do not always know if the basic statement or assumption is true. If the base information is not true, that is, people also run on the platform for other reasons, then your conclusion would be invalid or wrong. Another way to figure out why the man is running on the platform is to use inductive reasoning. Suppose you would analyze other possible reasons and observe what the man is actually doing and then draw a conclusion about his behavior. Reasoning that is based on specific facts and observation is called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is drawing a general conclusion based on particular observation. In the earlier example, you observed other person's subsequent actions or actions such as entering into the train compartment and returning with the bag. Based on your observation, you would conclude that the person had left his bag in the train. One mistake you would probably make here is jumping to a conclusion without knowing all possible facts. So from the above discussion, we can conclude that there are two types of reasoning, that is deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. The last process is your decision making. Inductive and deductive reasoning allow us to make judgments. In judgment, we draw conclusions, form opinions, evaluate events, objects, based on knowledge and the available evidences. Now consider this example. The man is very talkative, likes to mix with people, can convince others with ease, so he would be more suitable for a salesperson's job. Our judgment of this person is based on the specific characteristics of an expert salesperson. So here we will discuss how we make decisions and judgments. Sometimes judgments are automatic and require no conscious effort by the person and occur as a matter of habit. For example, 
applying brakes on seeing the red light. However, evaluating a novel or a literary text requires reference to your past knowledge and experience. Judging the beauty of a painting would involve your personal preferences. Thus, our judgments are not independent of our beliefs and attitudes. We also make changes in our judgments based on newly acquired information. Now consider this example. A new teacher joins the school. Students make on-the-spot judgment of the teacher as being very strict. However, in subsequent classes, they closely interact with the teacher and make changes in their evaluation. Now, they judge the teacher to be extremely student-friendly. Many of the problems you solve each day require you to make decisions. What to wear for a party? What to eat for dinner? What to say to your friend? The answer to all these lies in picking or choosing one of the several choices. In decision making, we sometimes choose among options based on choices of personal significance. Judgment and decision making are interrelated processes. In decision making, the problem before us is to choose among alternatives by evaluating the cost and benefit associated with each alternative. For example, when you have the option to choose between psychology and economics as subjects in class 11th, your decision would be based upon your interest, future prospects, availability of books, efficiency of teachers. You could evaluate them by talking to your seniors and faculty members and attending a few classes. Therefore, decision making differs from other types of problem solving. In decision making, we already know the various solutions or choices and one has to be selected. Suppose your friend is a very good player of badminton. He or she is getting an opportunity to play at the state level. At the same time, the final examination is approaching and he or she needs to study hard for it. He or she will have to choose between the two options, practicing for badminton or studying for the final examination. In this situation, her decision will be based upon evaluation of all possible outcomes. You would observe that people differ in their priorities and therefore their decisions will differ. In real life situations, we take quick decisions and therefore it is not always possible to evaluate every situation thoroughly and exhaustively. In this way, we have completed nature of thinking, the building blocks of thought and various processes of thinking like problem solving, reasoning and decision making. I hope you all have understood the concepts really well. Thank you.